So, good evening everyone. I'm Sally Shuttleworth and I'd like to welcome you to what is clearly the hottest ticket in town tonight. The event is a collaboration between the Royal Society and a research project I co-direct, Constructing Scientific Communities, Citizen Science in the 19th and the 21st Centuries, which is funded by the UK's Arts and Humanities Research Council and based at the Universities of Oxford with myself and Chris, Professor Chris Lintott, who you might be familiar with from Sky at Night, and also at the University of Leicester with Professor Gowan Dawson. We've been working in partnership with the Royal Society, and we're deeply grateful for all their support, and particularly the wonderful opportunity to work in their fabulous archives and collections. On the project, we've been looking at why and how the public have been involved in science, both past and present. In the Victorian age, the public flocked to science lectures in their thousands, literally, eager to learn about the latest discoveries. They were also involved in very practical ways in setting up local natural history clubs, for example, measuring rainfall or studying the stars. In the 21st century, we've been working with Chris Lintott and the vast online citizen science network he's created in Zooniverse.org, where the public can get involved in real science, whether classifying galaxies, counting penguins, or analysing the wonderful illustrations in 19th century natural history periodicals with our own project, sciencegossip.org. Now, before I introduce the speaker, I just have a few housekeeping announcements to make. At this stage, people normally solemnly announce, please turn off your phones. But tonight I'm going to announce, please do not turn off your phones, because this is going to be an interactive evening. So put them on silent, but make sure that you keep them on. More mundanely, there are no planned fire evacuations this evening, so in the event of alarm going off, uh, the members uh, of the audience should evacuate through the fire exits, which are at the front on the left, to the right in the middle of the room, and at the rear at uh, the, the entrance. And I'm pleased to announce that this evening's event is being uh, webcast live and recorded for the Society's archives, so we'll have people participating in the events from across the world. It is a real privilege to introduce Professor Marcus Osotoy, who's been working with the team from the beginning. Marcus is the Charles Simonai Professor for Public Understanding of Science and also Professor of Maths at the University of Oxford. And also, importantly, he's a Fellow of the Royal Society and in 2009 was awarded the Royal Society's Faraday Prize for Excellence in Communicating Science. I see Marcus as very much following in the footsteps of Michael Faraday and the other great scientific lecturers in the 19th century. He shows how science is fun, fascinating, and deeply relevant to virtually all aspects of our lives. What I love about Marcus is his versatility. He's worked, for example, with theatre company Complicité or with the Royal Opera Company on the relations between music and maths, and he's written and performed in his own wonderful play about maths, X and Y. You'll also be familiar with his work from numerous television and radio broadcasts and his books from the music of, Prime, of the Primes uh, um, in 2003, which I think has been the top-selling popular book in maths, through to his most recent work, What We Cannot Know. Our project has looked at large-scale involvement of the public in science, past and present. So it's very fitting that Marcus will talk to you tonight and indeed involve you directly in the wisdom of the crowd. So please join me in welcoming Marcus Asoto. Thank you, Sally. Well, I think there couldn't be a more topical time, frankly, politically, to be talking about the question of the wisdom of the crowd. Is the crowd wise or not? And that's something that I'm hoping you here at the Royal Society and people who are watching online across the world who can also get involved are going to explore with me. Um, I, I can see already from the questions that are coming in that uh, Brexit and presidents are quite high already <laughs> on the agenda. Um, and in fact, I tweeted last week um, uh, about this event. Um, uh, it was just when the... Um, 
uh, event happened in Oxford Circus where people thought there'd been a terrorist event and the crowd was went ballistic and uh, I got somebody retweeting back, uh, you weren't there, man, you weren't there. So we understand sometimes the crowd can uh, lead you astray. But um, uh, So as I said, this is going to be very interactive. You shall be uh, using your, I'm going to be voting as well. Um, and the wisdom of the crowd really uh, begins um, with uh, a little experiment that was done uh, in, uh, towards the end of the 19th century. Um, so I want to imagine that you're visiting a country fair and there's going to be a challenge. Uh, there's a big, ra massive, great uh, uh, bull and you have to try and guess what the weight of the bull is. Um, so I've just given you a range of different values. Um, so we're just going to use this as a little experiment to see um, whether your software is working. So um, and now you should be getting up on your uh, um, mobiles. Um, let me just see whether I'm getting... Um, so uh, you will get some choices to, uh, to vote on. Um, let's just see whether I'm getting... This is our test of our software or whether our Wi-Fi here at the Royal Society um, can cope with you all, such a packed audience. Um, uh, uh, if, if it doesn't quite work, I'm going to resort to putting hands up, um, which is also a great way to um, uh, explore the crowd. Um, so, yes, I don't know whether to refresh. I, I, I'm taking, say again? No, I've cleared my cache, so um, no. So let, let me just see whether you're getting, how many people are actually seeing the votes um, possible? Okay, so it's obviously just me. Um, uh, okay, so, uh, and you've pressed your send, uh, you've uh, pressed send what you think the, get the uh, weight of a cow is in kilograms. Um, okay, so uh, hopefully we've gathered enough data. So let me just see whether um, I've actually received some of this data. Um, so here we go, yes, okay, good. So we've got um, a good range of values. Um, it looks like uh, the most popular is around the 600 kilograms to uh, 1,000 kilograms. Um, so the idea was that um, this uh, um, uh, uh, guy, Francis Galton, went along. He uh, went to this fair in Plymouth, and there was this event going on. Now, Galton was somebody who didn't really believe in the power of the crowd. He believed that um, democracy should be just uh, given to those who had expert opinions and that the, the crowd mostly didn't know what it was doing. So he suspected that um, most people, if they took the average of the weight of the cows, that it would be way off because most people didn't know what they were talking about. And he was very surprised to find that um, actually uh, they got very close. So let me just tell you what the value is. So actually, um, uh, the weight of a big bull, I mean, I haven't got a specific bull here, um, but it's around this, so 13% of you. Um, so I might have biased this a little bit by giving you a lot of different values um, uh, uh, so later on in the range. So, so I think you're all getting ballpark um, the right region. But Galton was very surprised um, to discover uh, that when he took the average of about 800 guesses that happened at this country fair, um, that his particular um, ox was weighing 543.4 uh, kilograms, um, obviously, he wasn't working in kilograms because we hadn't joined the um, European community at that point. Um, uh, but, um, uh, and the average was at 543. So he was absolutely staggered um, at how wise collectively the crowd was, despite the fact that many um, people, I mean, if we go back to um, your guesses, um, some of you were guessing that it was up, up to 2,000 kilograms. I mean, uh, that, that's a very heavy cow. I mean, um, and some of you were right down at uh, less than 200 kilograms. So, you know, some of you are not individually very wise, but collectively you weren't far off. Um, and this is what was really struck uh, Galton um, and surprised him because he didn't believe in the power of um, the, the crowd to really make good decisions. And he wrote, um, the result seems more credible to the trustworthy of a democratic judgment than might have been expected. Um, and, and certainly a lot of people have really questioned whether the crowd um, is wise or not. Here's um, Nietzsche saying that madness is the exception in individuals, but the rule in groups. Um, uh, so is that the case or actually, um, uh, can a group be um, far more wise than we think? Um, Freud says the censor with the individual is set aside in the crowd. Suddenly you're given release because you can do whatever you want because they're like, hidden. And the instinct of basic, basic id impulses, which are normally confined to the depths of personality, come to the surface. The crowd thus provides a momentary release of otherwise repressed drives. 
which of course is what we're seeing on social media, that there's a kind of um, the fact that you can hide behind uh, the crowd of social media and just say things uh, and troll people, although um, Donald Trump seems to not worry about the fact that uh, everyone knows that it's him that's uh, tweeting such offensive things. Now, I was quite interested uh, to take um, an example. Um, so that was just a warm up with the cow, but we've had you, as you were coming in, um, looking at three different um, uh, jars full of jelly beans. And what I'm gonna do is by the end of the lecture, reveal how wise you were as a crowd. And I'm wondering whether maybe it's the question that you're asking is very important to understanding um, when is a crowd wise about certain things and when is it not. I did an experiment with the BBC where we took a jar of jelly beans in this kind of cylindrical shape and we asked 200 people to guess how many beans there were. Um, and I was probably equally as staggered as Galton was that um, there, there were such wild guesses from 250,000, but when we averaged them, there were about 4,500 in this jar, um, and the crowd were five away from the true answer, which is completely staggering. Now, I wondered, though, and this is part of an experiment that we're doing uh, to, to explore this, Perhaps it's because the crowd has a certain intuition about shapes it, it knows about. We're sort of used to pouring out uh, beans out of a tin. So a cylinder may be something that collectively we know about. So I'm intrigued to see whether if I take a kind of weird blobby shape or even um, a, a torus or um, a Homer Simpson sort of kind of donut, are these shapes we do not have such a good intuition about? And will the average be way off with these ones on very close to the cylinder? Or do we have an intuition about these shapes as well? And, and why exactly is that? Um, so we'll come to that at the end. We've also been doing this um, online throughout the week. So we, people have sent in guesses just from a 2D image. Is it important that you see the thing in real life? Um, or is it, um, uh, can you even make guesses online as well? So we're going to compare those as well. Galton was, it was interesting because uh, Galton was very, very obsessed with trying to um, see whether um, certain traits could be picked out in society. One of the things he felt was that you might be able to identify a criminal face. And the way he did this was he took lots of photos of criminals and then averaged them together, expecting to get some really horrifically um, sort of skewed face. Um, and was very surprised to discover uh, that actually when you averaged faces, um, the face turned out to be quite handsome. Um, and so although the faces individually were very kind of um, uh, perhaps what you would not call handsome, when averaged, they suddenly became handsome. Um, so I've done a little experiment. I took some pictures of some famous um, uh, uh, Hollywood stars, and I, I, and I want you to uh, say which of these um, Hollywood stars um, do you think is most beautiful? So hopefully you will get up on your screens now the opportunity to vote for one uh, of these three. Which of these three faces um, do you find the most beautiful? Um, so uh, you might recognize um, one of them. So uh, let's see, I'll give you a little bit of time to, to assess that. Um, uh, let's see, uh, uh, let me just check whether, are you getting the pictures up on your yeah. mobile? Good, and you're able to pick one and send it to me. Everyone feel like they've sent a picture? Put your hand up if you've sent your choice. Okay, that's good enough, let's um, see. Uh, what you chose. Um, so uh, interesting, yes. So you, you, a majority seemed to go for um, that first picture, uh, which of course was the one that I averaged over about 50 images of film stars. Um, there are still some quirky people who like um, kind of weird, well, I suppose you like Game of Thrones probably. Um, uh, exactly. So, so here's, uh, not to be sexist, so here's three male faces. Um, which of these do you find? So let me give you the vote to take part in. So you've got um, these three faces. Um, which of these do you find the most handsome? Um, so I'll give you a chance to pick your picture, send it in. Perhaps give me a show of hands to see whether you're, you're happy that you've sent your picture. Good, okay, let's see whether, uh, which one here. I'm kind of intrigued with this one because I asked my wife and I was quite surprised which one she chose. It was slightly disturbing. Um, okay, that's... Uh, <laughs> So, um, yes, yeah, so that was uh, so mostly that you quite like that first one. So, uh, let me just go back to the first one or the average third one. Um, but the, the guy in the middle really didn't get, um, so let me just see. Uh, the guy in the middle really didn't get much votes at all. Um, so, again, the average one seems to be something that you, you all 
quite like as handsome. So some of you, we asked actually when you came in, uh, we took some photos of you. Um, and and I, at the end of the presentation, I will show you what, what this crowd looks like. So we're going to do an average to see how beautiful you are uh, as a crowd. But uh, you'll have to wait for that, because that's um, at the end. And now, one place where it's very interesting, a game show, of course, uh, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, um, where the crowd gets a chance to show how wise it is. So I was quite intrigued to see what sort of audience we get here at the Royal Society, how wise you are on some, on, on some of the most challenging. So these are kind of like the questions towards the end of Who Wants to Be a Millionaire. Um, so I'm intrigued to see um, uh, what you as a crowd if, if the, the person up here says, oh, I haven't got a clue, um, uh, the answer, you know, which of the following men does not have a chemical element named for him? Um, if he then or she went to the crowd, uh, would you be able to help or not? So, um, so I'd like you to vote on this one. Um, which, which of these are scientists? So I, I, I chose one of the scientific ones. So maybe there's a lot of expertise here. Um, so which of these does not have a chemical element named for him? Is it Einstein, Niels Bohr, Isaac Newton, or, or Fermi? Um, so you've got a chance to help him win the million or her win the million. Uh, how 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 wise are you? So no, no conferring. Gosh, you're not allowed to confer. So that's like mumbling. Gosh. No, you've got to individually help. Um, uh, so so good. Uh, let me just check how many of you voted, helped out. Uh, the are we going to win the million? Okay. So uh, let's see uh, what you decided. Oh wow. Whoa. How rare. Very interesting. So. That's quite a spread. So actually, um, uh, just uh, ahead of um, Albert Einstein um, is, is Newton. Um, so it, it, so uh, the person probably would have chosen Newton. So what was the right answer? You seem very split on this. I, um, uh, let's uh, uh, reveal the answer. So it was, in fact, Newton. Yes, and the people whooping in the back there. Um, of course, Newton has a, a unit named after him, but not uh, an element. So, so you would have helped there. That's great. That's enough. 30 is just above 29%. Um, okay, so uh, do, you, do you want another one? Yeah, he, he, here's uh, this one here. I can barely say this word, but um, so let me, uh, uh, so I'm going to send you the vote. So this is the word nephelacochegia. Ne well, you get a million if you can say that. Nephelacochegia is the practice of doing what? Is it the practice of finding shapes in clouds, sleeping with your eyes open, breaking glass with your voice, or swimming in freezing water? So, so how wise are you as a crowd this time to help win the million uh, when this question comes up? So have a think about that one. Perhaps you can know a little bit of Latin, break that down. OK, uh, put your hands up if you voted, you've sent me your answer. That's enough. Yes, let's see how good you are. Um, so this is what you thought. Mm, OK, so um, we've got sleeping with your eyes open uh, as the, the winner there. Um, uh, and then next, finding shapes in clouds. And most of you think breaking glass and swimming. So what was the right answer? It was, in fact, finding shapes in clouds. So this time you weren't wise enough. They would have lost the million had they trusted you on that one. Um, OK, so uh, a final one, just to see how good you are. Um, this one here uh, is kind of an interesting one, especially because it's a mathematical one. Um, so let's push this one to you. So a number one followed by 100 zeros. So we, uh, we have a name for this in mathematics, one followed by 100 zeros. Um, uh, Intriguingly, on this one, so you can start voting. What do you think it is? Is it uh, Google, a Megatron, a Gigabit, or a Nanomole? Um, uh, of course, you might remember that this question was the million dollar question for uh, um, Commander. I can't remember what his name was. Um, and, but he had somebody in the audience who was feeding him the answers with coughs. Yeah, because he didn't know the answer to this. And in fact, he won the million because the coughs indicated the right answer. So it's, I can hear somebody coughing. Stop it. <laughs> Uh, um, uh, I know the answer, it's fine. Um, uh, uh, so, um, and in fact, um, he had to, he was taken to court and had to give back the money. So let's see what you thought. Um, yes, you see, I, you, I, I knew because you're all nice geeky people out there um, that you would get this one right. Um, so yes, of course, it is a Google. 
Um, this was the name that a, a nine-year-old um, nephew of somebody who was thinking of trying to get a number came up with before Google was even invented, of course, spelt differently. Um, so again, you would have helped the crowd in this case. Um, and it's interesting that analyzing who wants to be a millionaire, um, the crowd is generally pretty wise. It's at 91% of the time, they actually get, get the right answer collectively. Um, there we had 66% um, of the time. Um, and if you ask a friend, uh, that friend uh, generally is, is down to 65%. Um, so, uh, so the crowd in this case is, is, is actually quite wise. Um, but of course, uh, you know, actually the, the wisdom of the crowd has been um, bigged up recently because of um, the, the politics that has been going on. And uh, uh, of course, Gove really challenged the kind of idea of uh, should we trust an expert to tell us what's going to happen with the economy? And this was a very powerful statement he made, which I think um, had a very big effect during uh, the Brexit campaign because it, uh, it gave people the kind of right to stop listening to views that might have uh, expertise involved in them. And, and Gove got, uh, I think, justifiably a lot of stick um, uh, for this comment. Now, I think but this really uh, depends, again, on the sort of question. Maybe there are some times when uh, the expert may be not the right person to ask about a particular subject. But sometimes it's definitely an expert should be asked. Uh, uh, um, I mean, if I was going to give you a choice of who would fly you to, Nor to New York uh, tonight, um, you know, would you choose uh, Gove, Trump, or um, this pair here? It's actually a father and daughter um, pair of pilots for the British Airways. Um, I'm not going to even bother to ask you that question because, um, uh, 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 of course, you will choose the third. Um, but I think, uh, you know, so there's clearly an, an example where the expert, you want an expert. Uh, you don't want one of those two. But uh, there are very interesting examples um, politically where actually um, uh, asking the crowd about political decisions um, has been very insightful. Um, so there's a practice in Brazil that was started in 1989 something called participatory budgeting. And this is something which is catching on um, uh, globally where um, particular cities are trusting parts of their budget to, to the public to decide and not just the elected politicians. Um, and it's proving to have very beneficial effects in um, actually uh, making decisions for, for local governments. Um, there have been some very interesting examples, again, about taking power away from uh, politicians um, uh, who are very often sort of particular types of people and putting power to, um, to the, uh, a, um, a more general uh, part of society to make decisions politically. Um, there was an interesting example after the um, great crash in 2008 where Iceland um, actually uh, are invited uh, the public to try and help sort out the problem. And this, in fact, didn't really work because those that applied um, were those who had some sort of vested interest in actually being involved politically. And it sort of biased um, who the crowd was. Um, but this is a very good example in British Columbia and Ontario where um, uh, it's been shown that um, uh, by actually almost expecting people, like in doing jury service, to actually be involved and be part of the crowd in making political decisions um, has uh, made some very good political decisions for, for these um, particular um, uh, assemblies. Um, now, what makes a good crowd? Um, there have been some interesting uh, analysis of the different qualities that you need in a crowd. Um, one of the important things is that there should be a diversity of opinions, such you shouldn't just have one idea. You want to be sort of uh, going over a range of different ideas and hopefully seeing that one of them perhaps dominates. Another really important thing is independence. I, I actually stopped you chatting to each other because that can actually start to affect uh, the uh, of, uh, decision. So you want independence, so somehow um, you really are getting a genuine collective experience. Decentralization is another one. Um, so you want the idea that things aren't centralized, so you only have sort of one source of um, ideas that you can tap into particular expertises that one person might have, which might help to, uh, to guide the crowd in the right direction. And then aggregation. You've got to find some way to actually be able to interpret what the crowd is thinking. I've given you some ways where we're just counting numbers and taking the, the most of them, but sometimes it's a bit more subtle than that. How can you actually, um, you know, what is it you want to do? Is it take the average or is it take, taking the median, the halfway point? Which, uh, what is the best way to actually get the information from all of the data that the crowd is giving you? 
Um, so there are some very interesting examples um, where uh, sometimes it isn't just uh, about independence and diversity, um, where sometimes that chatting can help. So I want you to not chat at all, and I want you to try and answer this question. How many goals were scored in the 2010 World Cup? Um, so I'm going to give you some options. Um, so you should have coming up on your screen um, some options for how many goals were scored. Um, so uh, some of you may have expertise in football. I've given up going to see Arsenal playing Huddersfield this evening to come and talk to you. Um, so, but some of you may have no clue at all about how many. But So I just want you to, to make a guess at how many goals you think uh, were scored at the 2010 World Cup in South Africa. Um, you sent that to me, you put up your hands if you've uh, given me some data. Excellent, so let me see what you thought without any sort of discussion at all. Um, so here we go. Uh, so, right, so most of you are sort of going for about uh, 76 to 100, we've got 24% there, and then 19% at 100 to 125. Um, we've got 14% at 126 to 150. Then 151, 175, about 15%. So it's that poor sort of ballpark figure. Um, let's see if we can make this any more accurate. I'm not going to tell you what the answer is yet, but I want you just to spend a little bit of time uh, with the people that are next to you discussing why you thought it was this and whether you know, perhaps some of you had some expertise, some ideas perhaps for how to, to make an estimate of this. So I'm going to give you just a little bit of time to, to talk amongst yourselves. Um, <laughs> Is chatting about this going to help? Okay. Uh, oh, sorry. I've probably blown the. Oh, the guy upstairs. Is, am I right? Did I didn't blow the mic? Sorry. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay. So you've had a little bit of discussion. Maybe you've sort of said, well, yeah, there are this many matches, and probably what's the average? About three goals. So now I want you to vote again, and let's see whether it makes any difference on the 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 number of goals you think might have been scored. Okay. Put up your hand if you've sent me your data. Yeah, that looks like enough to, to have a, a, another view. So let's see whether anything has changed. Right, so um, there seems to be uh, not much change, actually. <laughs> uh, that's interesting. So um, uh, there, there's sort of uh, still a concentration around 76 to 100. 101 to 185. Slight drift, I think, to 126 to 150. Um, let me just see whether I can see the data. Um, uh, let's see on, on that one. So there you see you had, um, uh, I think quite a few, lot of you have been dragged a bit higher. Let's just see. Um, so you've been dragged a little bit higher. Uh, and interestingly, now, if we were going to take the, you know, which one is being voted for most, um, you are in fact correct. Um, so it was 145 goals. So, you, you, so a lot of you were underestimating, uh, but with some uh, uh, you know, collaboration, some local collaboration, but still I kept you as a, a, kind of a crowd of, of kind of small groups, actually was much better. So there's an interesting message here that maybe it isn't just always about an independent view. Perhaps sometimes the crowd is wise when it aggregates a little bit uh, amongst itself. And this is um, a piece of research that has just been uh, about to be published in Nature in Human Behavior um, by some scientists in UCL and Argentina uh, that have shown that actually um, the, the kind of uh, guesses at particular questions. So in fact, uh, question A was the number of goals. Um, so these are interesting questions because you can actually do a little bit of analysis of that and say, well, you know, there's a logic to this. How many goals, how many matches? And you, you can actually pull some expertise within a group to, to help steer towards the correct answer. So again, I think it's relevant. Um, the range of questions they had here, some were like, uh, how tall is the Eiffel Tower? Um, but some of them you could actually use some helpful expertise expertise within a group to steer you perhaps more towards a particular answer. So I think this is an interesting new piece of research which shows that maybe it isn't just independent um, uh, people, it's, it's actually collecting the group together. 
Um, now, one of the problems is aggregation. How do you actually interpret what the crowd wants? Um, and this is really relevant when it comes to voting. If you've just got two people to vote between, it's very clear that the person who gets the most votes should be elected. But what if there are three people um, that you want to vote for, and the votes are kind of spread, um, and you have the chance maybe to say, who would you prefer second, and I definitely don't want this person, and put them third. Um, Arrow's impossibility theorem shows that it's impossible when you have more than two people to sort out um, uh, the, the data that's coming in such you can satisfy the kind of basic things you'd want to be a fair vote. If most people are voting for somebody that that person should win, um, that there shouldn't be one person who is dictating everything. Um, as a little example of this, um, suppose uh, uh, voter one, we've got three candidates, A, B, C. Voter one orders them as A, B, C. Voter two is B, C, A. Voter three is C, A, B. Um, who would you elect in this particular case? Um, you'll, you'll find that, in fact, any particular choice that you will make um, is, is going to make two people unhappy. Um, suppose I decided that uh, under the voting system I'm using that A will win this, but we see that voter two and three would both prefer C to A and therefore will be very unhappy. In fact, A has become a dictator um, and is actually, uh, if I chose A, A would be a dictator in this case because it would be their single opinion which is deciding the vote. And it turns out that there's no way to actually aggregate this such that everybody will be happy. And this is actually a, a theorem which was awarded the Nobel Prize, that it isn't always possible to take data and actually understand what the crowd is actually thinking. Here's a question for you, one of those kind of like optical illusion things. So um, I'm gonna, I've got uh, one line on the left and three lines on the right. Uh, I want you to enter, so I'm going to push this to you. I want you to vote on which line do you think has the same size as the one on the left. Um, so there's a little, very little version of it. Um, it should be, you should be able to see this image on... Um, uh, okay. uh, the, so you should be able to see this image. So I'd like you to vote which of those um, three lines is actually the same size as the line on the left. Okay, so um, let me see. Have you all voted? You've sent me your, your data? Everyone? You're still thinking. It's fine, yeah. No, you're not allowed to get your ruler out. OK, uh, just another show of hands, see whether I've got enough data to go. Yeah, that looks great. OK, let's see um, what you thought. Um, so here we go. Yes, so most of you went for C, which is, um, in fact, the correct answer. Um, uh, there are a few of you who went for, um, uh, for B, interestingly. M uh, maybe I kind of uh, um, so sold you a red herring with saying this was an optical illusion. So it wasn't an optical illusion. It was, um, <laughs> uh, it, it was actually just that one was the right size. Um, <laughs> Uh, but why I sort of said that, I, I was interested to see just whether that would push you with a little bit of leading to maybe not trust yourself. Um, because this is an example of an exercise that was done to show how the crowd, individuals in the, in the crowd, can start to, to really not trust their own views. And as they see the crowd moving in one direction, will just go, yeah, but I think it's, but they're all saying this. And so I'm going to follow them. Um, and this is a, a classic uh, social experiment that was done where, um, by Solomon Ash, he got uh, um, students to, cut, uh, to be in the room and um, uh, five of the students were in on the experiment and the sixth student uh, was not. The five students um, faced with this um, all, all, all went in turn, uh, which is the biggest uh, line? And they would go B, 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 B. And then the sixth person would be faced with this, but, but I think it's C. That's really, but they wouldn't stick out. Uh, they didn't want to look uh, different. They wanted to conform, and they didn't trust themselves. And the experiment showed time and again, they would choose um, the answer that the crowd had heard already. So this is the, the, one of the challenges um, of, of asking questions of the crowd. If they start to get um, uh, influenced by what the noise and the news that's going on. And of course, this is what often happens um, when the economy, if people start saying, being confident in a particular stock, you, you might not trust it, but you will start, you'll be drifting 
with the herd. So there's a real danger um, of the psychology of conformity. And I think this is particularly relevant for the crowd in our day and age when we have social media, which allows people to share views and push views um, uh, and, and actually destroy the independence of thought because we're starting to see the, the, the noise that's going on, the, the kind of trend that's going, and we will not trust ourselves. We will start to just see what's, uh, what's happening on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram will start to um, affect that uh, power of independence. Um, uh, here's another interesting uh, thing. It sometimes depends on, 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 on what your relationship is to the question and the crowd. Um, I've got two pots here. Uh, one of the pots has 70 red balls and 30 black balls. This is pot A. The th second pot, pot B, um, it's the other way around. It has more black balls, 70 black balls and 30 red balls. Um, now, I'm going to pick one of these uh, jars, and you've got to try and decide which jar you think it is. So, um, so I want you to, so you're going to get a pound if you get this right. I mean, not really. I mean, uh, um, but just imagine you were going to get a pound if you got this right. Um, so uh, now I've drawn a, a red ball out of this urn. So, you know, I want you to, I'm going to push this to you. So which one would you vote? What was your, you know, which one of these jars do you think it is? Um, so I'll give you a chance to vote there. And I, I, I would be very surprised. People are messing with me if they vote anything other than um, one of them, I would think, in this particular case. Um, but have you managed to push me your answers? Yeah, a few, a few. Put your hands up if I... Good, yes, yes, that's right. Get involved. Um, so let's see. Um, oh, yeah, so, so there are people messing with me out there. Um, so yes, of course, most of the red balls, uh, the, the jar with most red balls is the one you should vote for. Because if you've seen a red ball, there's a higher chance that it came from urn A, because that's got more red balls. Um, weird that 15% of you are voting for urn be, but um, maybe you think I'm... This isn't all about messing with your mind, okay? I, I know that very often it, it is a kind of thing, oh, I should, I should vote what he doesn't think I'm going to do, because that's probably the right answer. Um, uh, we'll get to that, all right? Um, uh, so, but now I'm going to change the problem a little bit, okay? So this is, the, again, this kind of idea of what happens if you start to get information from the crowd. Um, suppose the vote, suppose we started voting and we didn't know which one it was, and, and you'd all picked some balls. So perhaps three people in front of you have, um, have picked a ball, and it's been a black ball and they put it back in again. We've ruffled it up. They pick a ball. The second person picks a black ball, puts it back, ruffle it up. The third person picks a black ball, ruffles up. Your turn comes and you've got to pick a red. You've got to pick a ball and it's red. Now, I'll give you a pound if you get it right. It, which uh, would you vote for now? with this information. So you've got information from people who've um, uh, been e experiencing this pot earlier. So let me push this to you. So um, which of these pots would you vote for now? You, you've got a red ball out of this, but you've got extra information here. You'll get a pound. You individually will get a pound if you guess the right jar. What are you going to vote for? So hopefully, put your hands up if you manage to send me your votes. Excellent. Let's see what you voted for. So um, three people were getting black ones. So, so now most of you are going for the, so you voted against the ball that you chose, although you got a red ball. You said, no, I still think I've seen a lot of people pick black balls. The probability is um, that that's actually uh, the urn B, which has more black balls. Um, so again, there are 17% messing with me um, a little bit, but that's fine. Maybe you think, oh, well, you know, I'm going to trust my ball. I trust that one rather than the other three. Uh, now I'm going to change the question because this is, uh, shows the relationship uh, of uh, the individual to the question of your relationship to society. Um, what if actually um, uh, the crowd all gets a pound if you get it right. Um, so th this time, the same scenario has happened. Um, we're going to get each of you to pick a ball out of this jar. So three people have just picked a black ball out, but now you've picked a red ball out, and we're going to keep on going and then aggregate the votes. Now what you should you do? This time, you, you, look, if the crowd gets it right, if the average of all of you gets this right, you will all win. So what should you vote now? So it looks like the same information, but the reward is different. You've seen three black balls, you've picked a red ball. So should you vote black or red now? Should, would you vote, um, so last time most of you said, oh no, okay, I can see this, it's mostly coming out black. 
but is that going to be helpful now to win the crowd the prize when we go through all of you? I mean, there's going to be sort of several hundred of you um, uh, making your votes, and I'm going to give you a pound if you get it right. So let me push this to you. What's your decision now? Um, are you going to vote uh, red uh, mostly or black mostly? So, um, so remember, you'll get nothing if the crowd gets this wrong, but you will all get a pound if you get it right. Does it change your decision? Is it so confusing that you're not quite sure? <laughs> Which is fair enough, because it's sort of a different kind of like, OK, right. Uh, OK, so how many people have voted? Yeah, that's good. Let's uh, see what you think. Um, so should you, you know, so you've got a red ball, um, but you went black last time, so you went B. But should you vote black uh, B this time? Um, interestingly, a lot of you did. So a lot of you have still voted, well, you know, I saw a red ball, so, uh, so, but the other three saw black, so it's probably, um, uh, 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 it's probably that one with all the black ones in. But you haven't helped the crowd this time. It would be much better collectively if you'd voted red, because it would give you the crowd much better chance if you'd all, if those who'd voted red, suppose we might just have had a little blip here where there are three blacks, and then suddenly there'll be lots of red. But all of those who got a red ball could have helped to tip the crowd to say, well, yeah, but uh, uh, 75 of you got a red ball and only 25 of you got black balls, but the first black balls are the ones, and you started uh, following the crowd right at the beginning. So it would be much more helpful to the crowd if you'd voted against what you thought um, it should be. I'm seeing a red ball, but I should vote that it's the, the red one, even though I've seen more black ones from the other players, because later on that's going to be more helpful to the crowd. So it's important what the effect is going to be on society about how you should um, make your vote. And this, I think, is very relevant to the question of, say, vaccination. Vaccination individually, yeah, of course there's a risk that your, your child, um, uh, there's always a risk when you're taking a, a vaccine of something going wrong. It's a very small risk, but the collective risk um, that uh, the benefit to society means that we uh, should all get our kids uh, vaccinated. But this is an interesting uh, result. This may be uh, that perhaps you didn't understand uh, the full uh, impact of the question, or maybe, um, no, I see a red ball but there were loads of blacks, so I'm gonna vote black. Um, so, so again, it's important. This is kind of something called information cascade. As you start to see information come in, how does that affect your vote? Uh, and certainly it does, because you got more information and, it, and you didn't trust yourself that it's um, the red one, you went for the, the mostly black one. But if actually your vote would help collectively the crowd, you should be voting still um, that it was jar A and not jar B. Um, now, I'm going to move us out slightly different. So I've broken the talk up into three kind of sections um, uh, marked by my different suites that I have in the background. So we started with jelly beans, and now we're moving to the Smarties section. Um, and this is um, the role that actually uh, the crowd can play, uh, as we've heard in the introduction, in doing science. Um, we're here at the Royal Society, a bunch of, a load of experts here um, elected each year um, in, in their specialist subjects. Um, uh, this was traditionally, um, science is the domain of somebody who's specialized for many years. What role can scientists, um, uh, uh, the crowd play in helping us to do science? And um, the, what we're celebrating today is really the culmination of the C Constructing Scientific Communities project, which really shows that you know, the crowd can play a very important role sometimes in helping scientists to do science. Um, and I think uh, one of the, most, the best examples we uh, started in Oxford by Chris Lintot and his uh, group is this idea that uh, we're getting so many images of galaxies taken by the telescopes that the PhD students and postdocs just cannot manage to look at them all. And this is a perfect um, scenario for maybe to get the crowd to help out in classifying different galaxies. Um, one thing that humans are very good at is spotting sort of patterns in pictures. Um, and so they've been asking them to, to, to classify all of these images and help out in, in seeing well, what um, these galaxies look like. So there are different sorts of galaxies. I'm going to give you just um, two choices, whether you're seeing some spiral in this galaxy or is it a kind of spherical smooth galaxy. Um, so this particular one here, um, uh, if you want to, to vote on that, do you think that's a spiral galaxy or a smooth spherical galaxy? Um, so this uh, image will have been taken automatically by a telescope, downloaded, um, and uh, hopefully you will all have spotted um, that it's got something in it. So uh, have you managed to enter your votes? Let me see. Yeah, I think that's enough data. Um, and hopefully you will have seen that, yeah, that one's a spiral. So there was a spiral. Maybe your, the resolution on your 
phone is not good enough to see the spiral. Um, so in that case, you, you all did very well. And it's very important. Some people will make mistakes, and that's fine. Um, but the way that we're doing this citizen science means that because you can take the majority um, view, we can be pretty certain that that was a spiral galaxy. Now, um, uh, Chris and his team sent me this morning some new images which have never been looked at. So in fact, you are going to be helping us to do citizen science um, this evening to look at two um, galaxies which have not yet been classified. These haven't been seen uh, by the public yet, so um, uh, let me show you this one. So this is an image. It's taken by a telescope in Chile, I think, uh, if I'm right. Um, and I think it's taken over like 300,000 images of galaxies, something like that. So this is uh, so a new set of data which which has come through. Um, so uh, you are going to help us now by voting. Is that a kind of, can you see some spirals in there? Or is this kind of a smooth, uh, spherical sort of galaxy? Um, if you can put your hands up if you have voted. Let's see whether I, that looks terrific amount of data to have a look. Um, so uh, yes, so some of you are starting to see spirals. Um, uh, but the majority have gone for smooth and spherical. And I think that's what the team would expect you to, to classify that one as. It's certainly not a spiral one. And then they might go on to ask you some more interesting questions about that one. But, um, but certainly, there you are. We've, we've done a little bit of citizen science tonight. Let's do one more image. Um, so here's another image. Um, this one's a little bit harder to kind of make out, maybe. Um, but this um, image, uh, is it smooth and spherical, or is it a spiral galaxy? Um, sometimes they're also interested in whether this, the, um, uh, it's spinning one way or another. Um, but let's uh, see what you vote on that one. Um, so if you've pushed, put your hand up if you managed to push me your answers. That's a good amount of data. Let's say, so let's see. So yes, you are seeing those spirals. It's a little bit um, less clear than the first example. Um, so this has been very helpful in actually classifying different galaxies. But I think uh, one of the extraordinary things which came out of the Galaxy Zoo project is that um, sometimes the crowd can spot things the scientists haven't noticed uh, and, and strange things that maybe uh, scientists have said, yeah, that's just a blip. Um, and there's a beautiful example of a paper that was actually published thanks to uh, data that uh, citizens were saying, but I keep on seeing this weird thing which looks a bit like a green pea. Um, and this was been data which had been sort of ignored before, but because enough citizens were starting to say, but I, yeah, I saw some of those as well, that this is now being classified as a new sort of galaxy. And there have been papers written about this. So a real um, example of uh, a citizens actually noticing something that the scientists perhaps um, had got blinkered to. Um, uh, th this one here, we met, was, uh, Sally mentioned the, the penguin project. Um, I, I was, uh, uh, one of the things this really uh, taps into is the human ability to look at images and spot what's going on in the image. And traditionally, computers were very bad at this. But co computers have really stepped up the ability for computers and machine learning to actually interpret what's going on in an image has meant that um, it, it isn't just citizens who are good at looking at these images. Um, so I was interested to ask uh, Chris, you know, are, are you frightened that um, the citizen might be put out of a job? I mean, we're all frightened that we're all going to get put out of a job by machine learning. Um, and, and so the penguin one, he gave me a very good example. Um, for example, here's a number of penguins. So the project is um, uh, in, in Oxford, the zoology department are interested in in, in counting penguins in the Arctic um, and um, or in the, the Antarctic. I'm really bad at biology. Which one is it? The Antarctic, yeah. So there you go. My apologies. I, the, the, being the Smyrny professor for the public understanding of science means that people think I know everything, but uh, there, there are weak points. So the Antarctic, um, so uh, instead of going there all the time, you can set up a camera and then you get lots of images. So uh, I'm going to push this to you. How many uh, penguins can you see in this image? And this will be how um, the public will be helping uh, the zoology department to actually, um, so, you know, obviously there'll be zero penguins in the Arctic, and then count these ones in the uh, Antarctic. So how many penguins are you seeing in this image? Um, so you count them up. There's a slightly tricky one. I can see a tricky one because there's one hiding behind another, maybe. Um, so give me your hands up if you voted for this one. That's a good amount of data. Uh, let me have a look. Um, so yes, so many of you spotted that there was one hiding behind the other one. 62% said there were 10. But there was also one just on the horizon. Yes, there are some very self-satisfied people who said, yes, I, I, spot, I, I, I spotted that. Yes, look, it's just over the horizon. You didn't spot that one, did you? Uh, no, so exactly. So interestingly, there are 11 in this picture. Um, and, and that's uh, what, you know, what's interesting that sometimes you was, if, if you saw that data, you say, why 33%? And you say, oh, yes, actually, they spotted one that you hadn't. 
But I, I, I challenged Chris uh, with, you know, surely machine learning is going to put you all out of a job. And he said, well, one of the things that humans are very good at is shifting methodologies, m shifting languages to describe something. So you see, um, that's fine with those sort of images. But what if you were then suddenly shown um, uh, this particular image? <laughs> now, what would you answer now? How many penguins? Look, there's a guy in the front actually counting them. Yes, I, uh, I was one, two, three, four. So how many would you think there are in this picture? Lots, lots is a terrific answer, exactly. That's the, the answer that most humans go, look, I'm not even going to bother with that. I'm not even, yes, yeah, you could do a wisdom of the crowd on this and make a guess, and maybe we would take the average, but lots is a very good answer to this. And a computer, unless it's actually been given this kind of option in its vocabulary, will probably start to count that and crash. Um, so I think it's a, a great example where the crowd in collaboration with machine learning, is going to be making the progress. And in fact, the crowd is helping the machine to actually classify the data that it's seeing. So we're helping the machine to learn by doing classification as well. Um, there are very many interesting projects. Um, I was interested in projects that maybe citizen science could help mathematics. And this seems to be a real challenge. There is one where you can use your computer to find um, uh, big prime numbers, but I don't think that's genuinely citizen science, because that's just using your um, CPU time. It's not you doing it, it's the computer doing it. Um, so that's the GIMPs project. Um, there's a, a Timothy Gowers in Cambridge was interested in trying to use social media and uh, the, the internet to get people collaboratively working on maths problems, and he started this thing called Polymath and set some challenges, and people did collaborate much more than they do. Mathematicians tend to work very much on their own or maybe in pairs. This had about 20 people, but the 20 people that were able to get involved were all experts. So again, I think mathematics is an interesting challenge for how we can do um, citizen science. Um, sometimes it's not about uh, the collective wisdom of the crowd, but one individual in the crowd. Uh, there's a wonderful project on protein folding, uh, trying to understand the ways that proteins can fold, and this uh, really affects uh, things like degenerative diseases to understand with the brain. Um, and, but this is a game that you play, and you see who's best at folding this thing. And most of the data they throw away, and every now and again, there'll be one individual who finds an extraordinary way to fold this, and that will be the data that's taken. So sometimes it isn't about a collective wisdom, it's finding in a large crowd one person who's very good at this game. Um, but one of the things that I was very struck by, I thought that citizen science was a very modern kind of idea about using social media and things. Um, oh yes, yeah, so I was going to tell you about this project. This is um, uh, really about saying, it, it, you know, don't even involve the scientists at all. This is a project by Bo Lotto, who is a university research fellow here at the Royal Society. And he got um, a school in Devon to actually start doing some science. And they started to observe some things with bees, um, some new um, uh, projects about how bees navigate color and distance. Um, and they were actually able to write a paper. This is all the authors on this paper, um, except for Bo at the end, um, are, are all just uh, students of primary school. And this, um, uh, I think, is starting to be called extreme citizen science, where actually uh, forget the scientists in the lab and helping them out. We're just going to do it ourselves. Um, but I was very struck by working with constructing scientific communities that this is not a new thing at all. And there are lots of examples of citizens throughout the ages helping out scientists in doing their work. Um, and some of them published here at the Royal Society. Um, in the transactions uh, the, uh, of the Royal Society, there's a very interesting example where Halley in, in asked um, 200 volunteers to track an eclipse. He was interested in how fast the eclipse was going to travel across the country. What is the speed of that shadow? Um, and he enlisted uh, volunteers um, to help him, and the data they collected um, is recorded in a paper in the transactions. Um, uh, unfortunately, uh, our group in Oxford, um, it was cloudy on the day in Oxford, so we weren't able to give any data at all. Um, the group in Cambridge, um, uh, unfortunately, uh, they were um, uh, oppressed with company, I think is what they said. P people crashed in, and they had to make them tea, and they missed the beginning of the eclipse, and, the, <laughs> and, the, uh, and so they didn't record any data at all. But fortunately, 200 people did record data, uh, and they were able to get quite a lot of information. So already in 1715, we're seeing examples of um, citizens contributing data to be able to help scientists track that shadow. Um, this is another example around the same time, lovely example that uh, Chris uh, Lintot told me about actually, um, uh, that uh, there was of course the celebration with all the fireworks, Handel wrote this piece, the piece of fireworks, uh, um, fire, about fireworks, um, and um, 
uh, and uh, they, uh, Benjamin Robbins, who's a, he was a fellow of the Royal Society, very young one, about 20, I think, um, was, thought this would be a great opportunity to, to actually observe these fireworks, see how far they, how high they went, how bright they would be. And um, in, in, in a particular journal, I think it was a gentleman's, um, what was it, the gentleman's? Gentleman's Magazine, what a great name for, yeah, so the Gentleman's Magazine, um, he invited citizens to send in their observations, um, but unfortunately the instructions were so complex he only got one entry from, <laughs> from a guy in Wales um, who said, I didn't see anything really, just a bit of flashing light and what a waste of money it was. So, um, so sometimes citizen science don't quite, projects don't quite work. Um, there's a very interesting one that Sally talked about, about collecting uh, rainfall uh, data. Um, this went on for some years and it's actually kept by the Met Office. Um, started with 500, 500 volunteers, went up to 3,400 um, by uh, 1900. This data is kept by the Met Office and is very helpful in looking at longitudinal understanding of uh, the change in climate. Um, the Met Office actually wanted to kind of uh, take this data and make it their own and it was very important um, for uh, Simmons that this be independent people, not people who are part of the group um, of specialists who weren't going to make these volunteers part of the specialist group. It was important that they were people with diverse and independent views. Um, uh, this is an interesting project which has been going on as part of um, the community, uh, constructing uh, scientific communities. This is about orchids, but ties into a project that was done uh, uh, some 100 years ago. And here again, we see the power of a longitudinal study that the way orchids are behaving now seems very different to when they were being observed in Victorian time. And again, this seems to be the impact maybe of climate change um, on uh, the orchids. Um, uh, and a, a new project which is coming out of um, uh, the research project it's looking at uh, trying to use the public to try and help us understand um, uh, what the public thinks about medical practices. Um, so they've got a little game that they've constructed, which I, I thought I'd play a few cards in this game. Um, so the idea is, do you, how good is the public in knowing um, what might be a current uh, uh, medical practice, a made-up one, um, or, or actually one that was... Uh, um, uh, has was there in the past and has been disproved. So, so I'd like you to vote on this one. Um, so this is actually, uh, you know, is this true or not? Blowing tobacco smoke into the anus of a semi-conscious person will revive them. So do you think that, that, um, th that people did think that, but it's now been disproved? Or do you think actually that's a very, you know, new current practice on the NHS? Um, <laughs> you can get tobacco enemas. Um, or, or, do you think, or do you think the group actually made that up? So perhaps you'd like to vote on that one. Um, See how good your um, insights into medical practice, past, present, and future, maybe. Um, OK, put your hands up if you voted for that one. Yes, I've got a good bit of data for that one. So what did you think? Um, uh, OK, so you thought that maybe they did think this was a good thing, and it's been disproved. Um, some of you th think it's actually current. Gosh, <laughs> OK. Um, right, uh, well, I'd like to know where your GP lives. Um, and, and some of you thought it's fictional because it does sound just completely bizarre. It is, in fact, a disproved theory. There was um, uh, a project uh, that um, people who fell in the Thames and were dragged out in order to revive them. Um, in fact, there were little stations uh, along the Thames with tobacco, uh, which you could then um, blow into their anus. Um, uh, uh, so, in fact, this was, but it, now it's thought that this probably doesn't help. But the idea was, you know, so, some sort of warmth and stimulation might help you to ride them. OK, um, uh, here, here's another one. Uh, so um, uh, maggots are used in hospitals to clean infected wounds. Um, so do you think that that's, um, yeah, maybe they did used to do that and like, long ago, and that's disproved. Or maybe that's current theory. Um, or maybe I made that one up, or the group made it up as well. So if you'd like to vote for which one you think that is, um, you push your data to me. Can you put up your hands if you manage to push? Great, excellent. Um, so uh, let's see what you thought about that one. Uh, see the data coming through. There we go. Um, so very good. It is, in fact, so many of you thought that's a current. It is, in fact, a current practice. Um, it seems to be a very good way uh, for cleaning infected wounds. So it is, in fact, used uh, to, uh, today at this moment, which is quite striking, because you might think that was certainly um, Disproved, maybe, but it is current. So you're doing very well on that one. So here's a final one. Um, eating too many bananas makes you grow more body hair because it increases your level of potassium. Um, so, uh, so now you have to think, uh, am I messing with you? Will I put, you know, nicely, equally distributed them? Or do you think this is a disproved one? Or do you think actually that's something we've discovered recently that bananas do? So if you'd like to send me what you think about that one. Um, and put your hands up if you've 
sent me enough data. That's enough to go on, good. Um, so let's see what you thought about that. Um, yes, yeah, so in fact, I did do a nice range of all three, so that one is a fictional one. So I made some. Um, so these are helping us to understand perhaps people's uh, current views on medical practice. So this will be a game that you'll hopefully be able to, to play online soon. Um, and now I want to come to the third section of my talk. Um, uh, we're going to get to some questions in a bit. Um, uh, this was such an exciting talk to prepare. There were so many things I wanted to tell you. So um, we, we've said this will run till 8 o'clock. So um, I want to take, take you now into an area um, perhaps sometimes where the crowd uh, maybe not as good as we think it should be. So um, or, or one, one, I'm going to throw a dice in a minute, and what I want you to do is just tell me what, what side do you think this dice is going to land on. So it's just a normal dice. I want you to, to make a guess at um, which face do you think this dice is going to land on. If you can send me your guess. Okay, see how many of you are going to get this right. Uh, put your hand up if you've sent me your data. Cool. Excellent. So let's see... Um, now, of course, I'm not really going to throw this. What I was interested in, just to see this kind of bias that happens. Oh, yeah, oh okay, I'll throw it. Go on. Yeah. Here we go. Um, so it was a four. Whoa! God, that, no, that's not, that's not the point. The point is... the. P The point is, actually, you, you have, because, um, uh, you know, it, you could have predicted this. One and two is not going to be a very popular vote, especially one. And, in fact, a lot of magic tricks depend on the fact if I say pick a number between one and ten, so many people will choose seven. Uh, and so the fact that the crowd can often have biases in them is very important to know about. Um, and in this case, yeah, you, you, enough of you went for six because uh, that's you know what you want to get on a roll of dice. You don't want to get one. And so we could have actually probably predicted that you wouldn't have got one. Um, here, here's another question. Uh, so uh, I took a particular volume of the uh, Proceedings of the Royal Society A. It's full of lots of numbers. Um, I want you to answer the following question. Uh, so I looked at all the numbers and counted up uh, the number, the, the digit, the, I looked at the first digit of the numbers that appeared in this journal, and I want you to um, tell me which digit do you think occurred most at the beginning um, of uh, uh, the numbers in, in this journal? Um, uh, one through to nine, or did they all equally occur? Um, so, uh, interesting. So, I asked you to pick a number between one and six, and you seem to be biased against. Um, uh, the, the lower numbers, but you were pretty fairly distributed. Um, so uh, put your hands up if you sent, managed to send me all your data. It seems to be working very well. Great. Um, let's see uh, what you thought. Now, some of you may know this theorem. It's called uh, Benford's Law. Um, so here we go. Um, so I, I think that uh, we might have some expertise knowledge here in the audience. I would guess from the fact that many of you said, well, I think one will occur most often. Now, uh, I, I put equally likely, I think most people's uh, uh, uninformed um, view would be that, well, surely uh, every digit is equally likely. Um, certainly the, uh, the digit at the end of a number is going to be equally likely. But the digit at the beginning, it turns out that there's a real bias towards the number one. Because if you think about data, lengths of rivers or, or the numbers of appearing in the proceedings, um, very often they will start, they'll be in the ones, tip the twos, and then uh, they'll spend a lot of time um, actually in the ones, tip two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And then when they go up to the next uh, place, um, they will spend a lot of time in that one. So it turns out that in certain amounts, of, with certain types of data, um, that one occurs um, uh, one in three times as the first number, and it drifts off towards uh, uh, the number nine. And this is kind of unexpected, because most people will, will not know about this thing called Benford's Law, and will think that they're equally likely. And if you're filling out your tax forms, it's coming to that time of year, um, the tax authorities use this to know when people are cheating on their expenses. Because if you are cheating on your expenses, you're making up numbers, you will, gra you will make them nicely evenly distributed, and you'll have well, one in one with a six here and a four here. Um, and if your expenses don't follow this rule, they will pull you in and say, we think these, these expenses are false. So it's important to know when there are kind of these weird biases. Um, <laughs> Um, okay, so you all got a little lottery form. I'm going to do a little lottery with you. Um, if you're uh, playing online, um, you won't have the lottery form, but what I want you to do if you're playing online is just uh, to, you know, hopefully you're sitting 
um, comfortably at home somewhere or driving. No, hopefully you're not driving. Uh, oh, no, but maybe you've got one of those machine learning driverless cars and you're listening to the lecture um, uh, uh, just sort of uh, whilst the car is driving. Just pick six numbers from 1 to 49. Uh, this is the old form of the National Lottery. Um, and what I want to show you is that um, uh, although the crowd can be wise, mathematicians can often be very wise about the crowd. So um, mathematics can make a lot of predictions about the way that you will behave. So, so hopefully you'll have picked your six numbers. Um, so uh, yeah, well, I'm not going to ask that. So I, I've got a little some, some balls here, and we're going to show it's independent. I'm going to get you to pick a ball for me. Um, great. So what have we got? Number. Oh, sorry. Yeah, you got to read it. Thirty-nine. Thirty-nine. Okay. So, of course, you wouldn't have chosen that because it's not your birthday. Um, so, 39 is your first number. 26. 26. Great. There we go. And we got uh, 36. Great. You got one. Excellent. Great. Anyone got two? Anyone got three? Ooh, oh, exciting. Um, okay. 46. Oh, we like the six ends, numbers ending in six. 44. Okay. Right, let's say uh, we've got, yes, 44, and we'll do last one coming up. And we've got number 38. Excellent. Okay, so uh, I want you to, so let me read them out again. For those online, it is 26, 36, 38, 39, 44, and 46. So now I want you to count up how many you got. And then I want you to tell me, um, uh, did you get none right? Did you get one right? Or is there anyone here? I didn't hear a whoop. So um, <laughs> did you get all six right? Um, now, of course, you could have been circling the numbers as they came out. And so uh, if any of you got six right um, uh, sitting here, I mean, uh, maybe it'll be interesting to see how many people we've got actually uh, sending us data from online as well. Um, so if you could tell me uh, how many uh, you, you got right. Um, uh, so have you sent me your data? Hands up if you sent me enough data. Um, so let's see. Uh, so if, uh, that's um, very interesting. So half of you didn't get any numbers right at all. And this is consistent. If I was going to make some predictions, um, uh, I'll show you the predictions that I m uh, made before you even did this. I would have said that half of you were not going to get any numbers right at all. There is one person who got all six rights. And now, um, uh, is it possible to see? Oh, here we go. So uh, I can actually see the numbers. So that's 82 um, people voting. OK, so, so let's see. There's probably just one person who got. Yes, OK. So, so the number of people voting, um, uh, OK, you see, uh, so I, already we can use a bit of mathematics to suspect that that person who's entered that they are all six right is cheating. <laughs> Which is, again, you know, it's that what Benford's law. So this is the power of mathematics to understand the crowd and understand when actually they might be cheating. So otherwise, I think that uh, this is pre pretty consistent. So here's the actual uh, split of how this would have happened with a large crowd. Of course, the larger the crowd is, um, the more accurate this is going to be. So uh, I'd need, uh, you know, 14 million of you sending in data for one of you to have got that six uh, right. Um, but it, it, we, well, the estimate was that about half of you are going to get uh, none right at all. So um, now I want you to now tell me something else because this is going to show, I think, um, how, how biased you can be when you're trying to behave randomly just now. But I want you to tell me uh, how many of you chose consecutive numbers, like 17, 18. Um, so tell me uh, no if you didn't choose consecutive numbers and yes if you did choose consecutive numbers. And I'm intrigued to, to see um, what the split is here because mathematically um, I can tell you that half of you uh, sh if you were behaving genuinely randomly, half of you should be telling me that you've got consecutive numbers. Um, because half the numbers that can come out of this box um, have two numbers together. So indeed, we've got 38 and 39 there. If we ran this over and over again, half would get. Now let's see how many of you actually did get consecutive numbers, because this is an illustration of how biased are you in your behavior. So actually, only a quarter of you got consecutive numbers, which is an illustration of how sometimes the crowd does not behave kind of rationally. This is if you are behaving randomly, genuinely randomly. So sometimes there are biases in here. Um, OK, how many of you chose 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6? 
Did anyone choose one, two, three, four, five, six? So, because um, uh, of course, uh, most of you are saying, well, that'd be a really stupid choice of numbers. Um, uh, so let's see if any, but I'm intrigued. You know, that's the most consecutive you can get, uh, all of them being consecutive. So um, if you sent me your data. No, I mean all of them. Yeah, I mean all of them. Did you choose one, two, three, four, five, six? Not, oh, I chose one, but not. So I want all your six numbers were the first one, two, three, four, five, six. So you may have sent me your data. Are there any able to take back their vote? Can they take back their vote? Once you've voted, okay, well, let's see what, um, uh, oh, well, so quite a few of you said yes. Um, uh, and I would say these were the uh, mathematicians in the room because these are the ones who realized that one, two, three, four, five, six is as likely as anything else, which is very unlikely. Um, okay, so here's another little challenge for you. Um, of course, uh, you know, actually, needn't have done this at the weekend. We are in a midweek uh, period of premiership games. I want you to estimate for me um, how many, so there are 10 games coming up this weekend in the premiership. How many of those will have Two players on the pitch um, with the same birthday. Um, so I want you now to, to give me your sense of, um, okay, what's the, how many of those matches? There are 10 matches. How many of them do you think will have um, two people on the pitch with the same birthday? Do you think any of them will? Do you think many of them will? I want you to tell me, from zero to 10, how many you think will have um, the same uh, uh, people with the same birthday on? There's a lot of discussing going on. Great, so have you sent me your, your numbers, your guesses at this? Put your hands up if you've made your guess. Great, let's see how many um, you think there are. Um, so I can tell you, so in, let's see. So a lot of you think there'll be, 18% think one match of the 10 will have two people with the same birthday. Um, maybe a couple. Um, some of you think all of them will. That's amazing. 8% of you think that all the matches will have, oh, it's changing. There's people sending in more data. Um, uh, but what's the right answer? Well, in fact, half of them. Amazing. H half of the matches this weekend will, and, and that what is a great reaction. What? I don't believe that. Um, and this is the, the, the counterintuitive nature of probability. We did a little test when you came in asking your birthdays um, uh, and, and your mother's maiden name, um, and we will be using that later to... Um, no, sorry. Uh, um, uh, we asked you your birthday to see how many people it would take to actually get um, uh, two of you with the same birthday. It, it took 25 people, we asked, before we got two with the same birthday. Mathematically, you can prove it only needs 23 to be more than likely that you'll have two people with the same birthday. There are 11 players on each side and a referee on the pitch, which makes 23. 23 players on the pitch, which means that half of those matches will have um, somebody um, which has uh, the same birthday, which is amazing. So you can test that this weekend um, if you're really that nerdy. Um, <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, I think um, I should probably um, uh, let you ask some questions. I, I've, I've just got too many things to tell you. So I'm going to let's, uh, let's uh, you've been sending me some questions as you've been coming in. So um, let, let's, uh, so, so this is, um, and, and uh, so th this is an interesting new kind of feature because generally when we get come to questions, I point at one person um, and you know they ask a question and nobody else is interested in it. So this software we've been using uh, from Glisser uh, has allowed you to send in questions and you've been voting during the talk uh, on, on which uh, questions you think were, should be pushed to the top as ones that should be asked. So should crowds be trusted to vote for a president? Um, so I, politics is clearly, and is 52% a large enough majority to make a, a major decision? Decision. Um, so clearly, this is um, uh, you know, very topical, the challenge of um, uh, giving uh, politics to the crowd to make decisions. Um, and uh, I think what was very striking uh, from the examples in Ontario, for example, um, were that um, what you needed was a mix of um, expertise and the crowd. Um, so actually, uh, the, the Ontario, they got experts to come in and actually talk to the people um, uh, about the particular issues so they could ask questions and become more informed. And I think that's sort of partly why the Royal Society is trying to do so much dialogue and create, you know, it's very difficult to make decisions on scientific issues if you don't understand the science and know what a stem cell is. But then, you know, the society 
deserves the right to be given the, the chance to make decisions. Now, I, I, of course, you know, this was a, uh, I, when we come to, so the second one, should, should crowds be trusted to vote for a president? Well, well, who else are you going to trust? I mean, how many people would say, yes, a crowd should be given? Um, put your hands up if you think a crowd should be uh, given the chance to, yeah, and, and put, put your hand up if you think they should not be given the chance. That, that's very interesting. So, um, yes, of course, we've had a very, uh, well, many would regard as a very bad example of the, the crowd. And maybe this is an example of, of uh, the, the cascade effect or um, uh, the, the conformity of the crowd where actually you can start to push, um, you can destroy the power of the crowd um, by using social media to, to actually, um, uh, so, so maybe that's the, the question, the, 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 the crowd, you know, it's about, of course, the crowd should be a, a allowed the chance to vote. Now, the, of course, in the second case of the Brexit um, uh, decision, uh, it, it's very strange that, it, that such a major decision um, was on, on a, just a majority vote, that I think most people, uh, given the chance, would have changed that maybe to, um, you know, it's got to be at 66% or maybe 75 um, And, and the, this, I think, uh, um, again, this is an example of, uh, my personal opinion is that people were not voting about Europe very often at all. It was about a protest vote. Um, and again, when did we last have this kind of vote? It's a very rare thing. We're not very used to it. If you go to somewhere like Switzerland, um, they're given the chance to vote on nearly everything that's uh, decided by their local government, and they're very experienced at knowing how to vote in, in referendums. So, so I think uh, partly, um, certainly I think 52 is, uh, was um, a, a crazily low uh, you know, it should be the threshold to make such a major decision um, should be should have been set higher. Also, the question again, it depends on the sort of question you're asking. The question was so so multi-interpretable that you know, people were voting in many different ways. Um, so, can we use the wisdom of the crowd to design a method to avoid queuing outside in the cold? Well, that's fantastic because I thought we let you in. Um, uh, we saw you queuing out there, and we saw the crowd getting cold. Um, uh, and so, uh, uh, so, yes, many of you obviously were a little bit cold, so we did try and get you in um, uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, should a single or few experts be allowed to outvote the crowd? Um, well, what's your opinion? Uh, let's see what you think. Do you think... Uh, um, in fact, I, I think there's a facility in there, isn't there, to... Um, uh, I think I'll take a show of hands rather than... Uh, there is a facility in here to actually create a new vote on this. But um, So do, do you think that um, there are certain... Uh, that, uh, well, again, I think this depends on the question, doesn't it? Really. I mean, how can you answer that one? But, but I think what the examples that I saw politically, um, and, and these were... There are a couple of books that I'd really recommend that uh, I read recently, which gave me some hope in politics in the future. Uh, George Monbiot's uh, recent book, and also um, a, a book called Donut Economics, um, uh, uh, written by economists in Oxford. Uh, and, and some of those really show that it's the combination of the diversity of opinion of the crowd mixed with an expert coming in and, and giving you the information that you need to make an informed decision. So I think maybe, um, yeah, there are certainly circumstances where you feel um, that the crowd shouldn't, uh, that an expert, for example, in a legal uh, case, maybe sometimes an expert, um, there's a lot of examples of probability misleading uh, a jury when in fact the expert can illustrate that um, uh, they, they should not have gone with their intuition because probability the crowd is very bad at. Um, okay, so um, is machine learning the future of the wisdom of the crowd? I think that's a very um, uh, interesting point because, um, uh, in, in a way, it's using the wisdom of the crowd, isn't it? Because the idea of machine learning is being so successful because it's got so much data that it can actually um, uh, learn from. Uh, and that's been the big change uh, that uh, um, algorithms was kind of programmed from the bottom, uh, from the top down, and sort of ha had, but these new algorithms are using machine learning to learn from the data. Um, so the crowd uh, is kind of helping the machine. You, you know when you go online now and you get asked, are you a computer? And you get shown a picture, and you have to say how many um, uh, signs or you know, how many penguins there are or something like that. Uh, you're not actually proving you're a, uh, a human anymore. You're actually training the computers because they need to know, all right, now I've learned how many things there are. So we're basically um, training the computers to take over. <laughs> um, so, um, so I, but the, the, there is an importance that the crowd is playing in actually helping us uh, with machine learning in actually classifying that data. Um, but, uh, and I would say even something like Google 
is an example of the wisdom of the crowd. That it's about um, we uh, produce links to a website, we are helping. It's the links to a website that beef up the page rank of a particular website. So by us um, interacting with the uh, and, and linking ourselves to a site saying, I think this is an important site, which is why I'm linking to it, the, the crowd is actually helping, uh, is enabling something like Google to work. What is the difference between the wisdom of the crowd and collective thinking? Um, that, that, oh, it's gone. Um, uh, that's interesting. So um, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure that I... Um, and collect, uh, I think collective thinking is uh, what I perhaps mean by, uh, would think I would mean by wisdom, that uh, you know, you're trying to get, um, I mean, wisdom is a funny word anyway, actually, to, to say this. I'm not sure I, I would necessarily call, I mean, it, we call, called it wisdom of the crowd going back to Francis Galton, but um, yes, yeah, so I'm not sure how to answer that one. Do you ever worry that, oh, oh sorry, oh, that one went. Does the age of the crowd affect the wisdom? That's interesting. Um, uh, well, I think that again, uh, given the uh, the qualities you want for a crowd, um, which is diversity of opinion and and decentralisation, um, that. Uh, I would suspect that a crowd that covers all ages would be collectively better at making decisions than just uh, focusing on one particular age range, because then you're going to get that bias of a particular opinion. So I, I would say that um, uh, there's a different question, and of course that question, it depends what you're asking, whether experience is going to help you because experience um, may enable you to make a more informed decision, but then you get stuck in your ways, and so maybe you want politically um, uh, challenging a young audience to to break the mold and things like that. So, so again, but I think uh, the the kind of idea is that this should be um, a very um, general. Um, how big does the crowd uh, need to be? Since the crowd in this room didn't have ninety one percent correctness. I think that's, uh, that's very interesting. When, when, does a, when does a crowd become a crowd? Um, and there, I mean, statistics helps us with that. So, you know, for example, when you say eight out of 10 cats uh, like um, a particular brand of cat food, well, how many cats do you need to ask to be confident of that? Um, and it is surprisingly few um, <laughs> uh, 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 that gives you a very good uh, chance of, of being certain that eight out of 10 cats. So I think statistics shows you that the crowd often doesn't have to be that big to be able to, to, be able to get some quite good informed decision about it. Um, do you ever worry the person you're following is, is following someone else? Um, I presume we're not meaning on Twitter, but um, I, I presume you're meaning that, yes, if you're, if you're following somebody's view, um, and, and this is very interesting, I think there's, um, uh, a case where, you know, when somebody's trying to set a new trend, um, the first person to do it isn't the most effective, it's the second person. So when you start to get somebody following, then that starts to cause uh, the, the drag to happen. So, um, so I think it's very important that, uh, again, this is, I think, the challenge of um, the, the sort of the herd mentality, that we need to make sure that we find methods to break the herd mentality, um, uh, uh, to make sure that it, it, we aren't just doing things because other people are doing them because somebody else is doing them. Um, is it possible to educate a crowd to behave in a particular way? Um, well, I, I, that's a very, uh, to, to educate, uh, you can certainly make crowds act in particular ways if you want them to. I mean, uh, one of the striking examples I saw of this um, was uh, you know, trying to make crowds um, in uh, Central Station in New York um, not sort of crash into each other. And what they found was that um, by putting, you know, that, um, the uh, ticket office at the middle with a big clock on it, this was put there in order to actually make the crowd behave in a particular way, and it caused the flow of the crowd to be much better for the for the um, station than if they didn't have this thing here. So, so certainly you can um, you can do things to uh, get the crowd. To, but I think this is um, you know relevant to things like uh, vaccination or um, uh, trying to tell the crowd, for example, 
uh, we, we now understand that if you're driving your car and, and a three-lane motorway and you move from one lane to another when it's very congested, that immediately causes um, something to, to cascade back, and it's a very bad thing to do. Could we educate the, the crowd as we're driving not to do that, to see, oh, I think that one lane's going a bit... F Every time you move in a congested area, so education there would actually help us collectively to, to, to move. I think this is a good example where actually things are counterintuitive or where you, you, know, you shouldn't have voted to go black when you had the red ball because you would have helped the society to vote in, in the right way if you'd voted red even though you'd seen many black balls. Um, to understanding why that is true, uh, I, I think, can change people's ways. But there's some very depressing research done recently um, which shows that uh, um, when people have formed an opinion facts do not seem to help very much in changing that opinion, um, which, you, you know, is very uh, depressing because, you know, the expert wants to say, no, you know, look, um, look, here are the facts about why we believe climate change is happening, why vaccination, but it seems that that isn't a very powerful way. And I think it's very important that scientists understand that it needs to be a combination, surely, of facts and an empathy for where the person is coming from with their particular views that can help that psychology and facts may be um, uh, help to educate the crowd. Um, great, I think we've done a load of questions. Hopefully some of those were ones that you voted for or asked. Um, um, I, I had got so many other exciting things to tell you, but um, uh, one of them was going to be about the Monty Hall problem. Um, but, but actually uh, what I want to do is to come back to these um, jelly beans. So I'm quite intrigued to see um, w what the, the guesses were. So um, I'm going to pull up uh, some slides. Which um, So we asked people online, uh, I actually don't know how many jelly beans there are in these. I, I would guess that this one is probably the most that the middle and that's the least. So if we could pull up the screen, which is going to tell us, um, or first of all, I think this is the, so the correct answers, um, uh, this one has, well, that's interesting. So yes, I, I at least got the right um, uh, magnitude. So this one had 1,114, uh, and the average was quite low online. So these are the online guesses. So online, you can imagine that you don't have a good impression of depth, it's quite hard. I would say that probably a 2D image would cause underestimation, which has happened in all of the cases. So, um, but now let's uh, um, uh, get uh, your guesses. Your guesses are even worse. <laughs> so, well, this really shows how <laughs> unwise the raw society crowd is. Uh, so, so interestingly, so um, uh, 781 uh, you, was your average for the cylinder. Uh, 577 for this strange blobby shape, uh, 9,600. Um, so they're all off by uh, surprisingly similar sort of amounts. Um, uh, so there's a tw Twitter guess. Um, so it, it seems um, maybe we should do more experiments on this. Um, I, I thought you would be better uh, at guessing this one than these two shapes, which are slightly more unusual. Um, finally, this is what you all look like. <laughs> you are beautiful. So thank you very much as an audience. I want to thank you all, our wonderful crowd, both here and online, for your magnificent participation, but also to thank Marcus, of course, for absolutely wonderful, entertaining, educative, uh, thought-provoking, and I wonder, do we now check next year the impact on tax returns? <laughs> I want to see the wisdom of the crowd. So thank you all for coming, and join me again in... Uh,